So welcome to the Human and Social Dimensions of Resilience, Bouncing Forward into Opportunity, um, uh, this afternoon's panel. And uh, we have two amazing speakers. We have to my left, Peter Calthorpe, who is a uh, globally uh, known uh, regional planner, city planner, regional planner, urbanist, uh, who has been doing a lot of work in California on resilient cities and resilient systems, resilient regions, master planning the uh, whole uh, high-speed rail system, does work in China, et cetera. And on my right is Paul Hawken, a noted author, businessman, thinker, who has been really thinking about the nature of nature and the nature of nature's resilience for quite a bit of time. Um, <clears throat> so we're gonna present some ideas, we're gonna have a conversation, and then we're gonna include you in the conversation. Danella Meadows was a great thinker. She was part of the Club of Rome that wrote a report in the 1970s about the limits of growth. And she was a very important systems thinker. <coughs> she wrote, she gave a talk that turned into an article called Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in the System. And one of the things she said is one of the most stunning things that living systems, and in fact, some social systems can do, is they can change themselves utterly by creating whole new structures and behaviors. In biological systems, that power is called evolution. In human economics, it is called technical advance. In social revolution, or, or social revolution, in systems thinking, it is called self-organization. So one of the things that we want to explore today is what is evolution? What is systems thinking, social revolution? What is self-organization? Because that inherent capacity of natural systems to evolve when they are faced by complex uh, issues uh, is really, I think, the key to resilience. Mm -hmm. To frame this, we are living in a very volatile time. The military in the 1990s came up with a phrase called VUCA, which stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. The rate of volatilities we've seen in financial systems is much higher than ever, and housing prices and real estate values has been much, much more volatile. But we're seeing volatility in every aspect. Look at the political volatility in the Middle East, in the Ukraine, in, uh, uh, in really uh, everywhere in North Africa. Uh, we're dealing with enormous amount of volatility. We live in a world that is totally integrated. It is a complex system. And so the volatility ripples through the system, and what happens in one place affects the other places much more than they ever used to before in the world. Um, and this is what leads to uncertainty. Because we used to be able to control our destinies. A town or a region kind of understood what its manufacturing base was, its resource base, its economy. And now it is completely buffeted by decisions made in China or the WTO or other things. We are all much, much more vulnerable. Within this framework of volatility, uncertainty, and complexity, and the ambiguity means it's very hard to have a very specific, clear strategy. There are a few macro trends that are affecting us, and these are climate change, water shortages, heat waves, fires. Those are human caused but natural conditions. There's income inequality, there's population growth, there's globalization. These are very large trends that also can buffet any city, town, or even nation. Um, that we don't have the ability to draw borders around ourselves and resist them. And so they add enormously to the, um, the systemic volatility that we're seeing. I want to put one more idea out on the table, and that is the idea of ecological pressure. Mm. So, uh, think about taking bacteria. We know if you're uh, taking antibiotics, you have some sickness, you take an antibiotic, and the antibiotic does a very good job and it kills almost all of the um, bad bacteria. But not all of them. There are a few that have evolved around it and it can't get. And those proliferate and the antibiotic can't stop them because these other bacteria have adapted around them. And what ends up happening is your ecosystem of bacteria in your stomach becomes much, much less diverse because the bacteria lowered the diversity significantly. And it has uh, negative bacteria, it has uh, pathogens, things that are not good for you, in, great in less diversity, in greater strength, 
um, and more proliferation. What we're seeing happening with the macro trends that I mentioned, such as climate change, is it's analogous to ecological pressure. So globalization is reducing the diversity of economic and localized systems. Climate change is also reducing the diversity of agricultural systems, et cetera. And yet what is emerging in that ecological pressure are the few things that can survive. So for, to go back to the financial system, we've seen a tremendous loss of community banking and the strengthening of a few large central global banks, taking some of the diversity, important diversity, out of the system. So the macro trends are actually in many ways reducing the diversity which is key for our resilient response to these issues. Paul, take it from there. All right, thank you. <clears throat> um, Jonathan asked me to talk about resiliency in nature. Um, the, the idea of resiliency really comes from uh, ecology. It, it didn't come from economics or any other <clears throat> discipline. It came from really C.S. Holling, who's, uh, I'm sure many of you know, his name, a Canadian ecologist, and he was he really did, with, along with Brian Walker, the seminal work on this idea of resilience. And <clears throat> resilience is really the persistence, or the ability to sustain a system um, <clears throat> in the face of change uh, or disturbance. And um, whether that change is stochastic or chronic, or whether it is from nature or it's anthropogenic, the fact is that that capacity to persist in the face of those changes is one way to define resilience. Um, the capacity to absorb it um, <clears throat> uh, means that the system is reorganizing itself in order to adapt. Okay, it has to reorganize. And the ability to reorganize depends on functions, structure, identity, feedbacks, these qualities. And if we look at like Katrina or Sandy Hook, we can ask ourselves how long did it take for the city or that region uh, to restore its function, its structures, its identity, and feedback loops. You know? And so that was the measure of the, 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 la the inability to respond. And we'll go back to that, visit that in a minute um, when we talk about panarchy. But they did, the Hollings and Walker defined four qualities that um, distinguish resilience. And uh, they are latitude, uh, resistance, precariousness, and panarchy. Um, and the latitude is really the measure of the, um, how much damage or disturbance a system can endure before it starts to break down. Or in ecosystem terms, before you get regime change. And regime change sounds good in politics, but in ecosystems, it generally means reduction to a lower level of functioning and productivity. So that's latitude, and it's a measure in itself, and it can be applied to anything besides ecosystems. And then there is precarious a resistance, which is, OK, we know the latitude, but how easy is it to push it over? How difficult is it? In other words, how well can the system resist perturbation or disturbance, right? And then there's precariousness, which is really um, how close is it right now to breakdown at this moment. These are not easy things to measure, by the way. So it's not as though there's an, um, a simple way to determine them. But it's very important that the concepts be understood, especially when it applies to urban environments. And then there's panarchy. <clears throat> count on a scientist to create a word that you know is more complicated than <laughs> need be. But it's an interesting word because we have oligarchy, we have monarchy, we have anarchy. So we use archy words all the time. And here comes panarchy. And archy is really comes from the Greek root to mean to rule or ruling, right? So an oligarchy is when we are ruled or something is ruled by a small group, a few. Oliga means small, right, or a few. Monarchy, mono, monarchy means ruled by one, okay? And anarchy means there's no rule at all, right? It's without rule, right? So panarchy is a word, pan, means all, everything. It means ruled by the communities 
of populations and systems and how well it describes how well they are connected. So in a resilient system, you have panarchy. And in a non-resilient system, you don't. So for example, when you go to the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, it was well known that the levees were very susceptible. <laughs> but it was only well known to a small group of people, oligarchy. It wasn't panarchically known and understood. Had it been, you would also need a governance system that worked <laughs> to respond to it, which it didn't have either, right? But so that's the difference between panarchy and other types of things. Another word for it would be just connectivity, but it's important that connectivity be understood not just in a sort of internet sense, which is great enhancement, but also there are hierarchies. And it's about how the hierarchy itself, governance in the case of a city, but also the business leaders, how well they are connected to all the communities within and how well those communities are connected within themselves and so forth. And the reason environmentalists often appear to be chicken little, you know, is because um, most of the population, understandably, does not have a sense of biological uh, limits or ecosystem limits that haven't been educated. So you have ecologists or biologists saying, watch out, this is, you know, diversity is going down and being very concerned about it. And the best way to illustrate this is with a story. And imagine two people uh, crossing the Nevada desert and they've just come over down into Reno and they're heading towards Colorado or wherever. And in this car, the only the passenger can see the gas gauge and the driver can't, right? So the passenger is like the ecologist, right? The driver is industry or whatever. And the passenger, it just as they pass a sign that says, you know, last gas for 310 miles, looks at the gas gauge and sees that it's an eighth of a tank. And then turns to the driver and say, you know, we ought to go back and get some gas. And the driver says, no, no problem, we got plenty of gas. And the passenger says, no, I don't think you do. And he said, look, I'll prove it to you. And he floors it and goes 110 miles an hour and says, see, no problem. And that's the world we have today. So we have basically industry, Wall Street, everybody saying, problem? You've got to be kidding. Watch. And, you know, stock markets, what? You know, I mean, you know, S&P, world record, you know, everything. Everything's great. And so that's why you get that division, because there is this fundamental lack of knowledge and understanding of limits. You know? And limits are not limits in the sense of foreclosure. Limits are pathways to innovation, opportunity, change, and actually a, b a better world. Now, <clears throat> the inability to predict the exact limits or thresholds has been used in a sense to marginalize people because they say, well, you actually don't know when and how, so you really don't know what you're talking about. But that doesn't mean the limits don't exist. And it's really impossible to predict that point of breakdown in a system a priori. It's not possible, which is why you need resilient systems to, and, and human systems. Now, those four words, latitude, resistance, precariousness, and panarchy, are really, to me, templates for uh, how we examine urban resiliency. And they can be used as a basis for redesigning, planning, configurations of buildings, neighborhoods, infrastructure. But I think most important, I hope really Jonathan and, and Peter will really double down on this, is really how we configure and design our buildings, neighborhoods, infrastructure to create social interaction. Because that is the true basis of resiliency, not the thing itself. And so there's a lot of talk about resiliency, about hardening, and you know, we'll hire the Dutch, and we'll keep the water out. And, you know, and that has nothing to do with resiliency. Excuse me. Nothing to do with it whatsoever. I mean, it's a good thing to do if you're Miami, no question. I mean, it's like just common sense. But that is not building a resilient city. And going back to panarchy, what we do know about systems is that the more you connect a system to itself, whether it be an ecosystem, your immune system, an economic system, a community, the healthier it is. And resilience and health are almost synonymous in some cases. And the example I want to give of that is your body, which you have a trillion cells. We talk about the 100 billion neurons, but you have a trillion cells, 90% of which are not human, as you know. They're not human cells. 
That's a community inside you, okay? An incredible community that Jonathan broached uh, on in his talk. But each of those cells, whether it be human or non-human, it's in every second is, is undergoing 400 million different functions every moment. And you multiply 400 million times a trillion, and basically you get 24 septillion functions going on in your body right now, right? And, uh, and now, and now, and now, and now. And that's more than all the stars in galaxies in the known universe. And it's in you right now doing that stuff, OK? So my question for you is who is in charge, right? Are you? Let's a political party? Let's hope not, right? In other words, it, it, it's self-organized. It's self-organized in ways which are so deeply mysterious that we have no idea how it really works. Right. And I think that the, one of the examples um, that I like to close with is to, sort of counterintuitive, which is New York City itself. And the Santa Fe Institute has study about food, food and New York. How much food does New York have, greater New York? And they did a study over a century. So during wars, blackouts, depressions, demonstrations, whatever, New York City has never had more than three days' worth of food. And it has never run out of food. How does that work? That's panarchy. Who's in charge? Thank God, no one. <laughs> right? So when I, we talk about creating the conditions for resiliency, we're talking about creating you know, governance systems that know what not to govern, <laughs> as well as what to govern and how to govern. And when we talk about architecture, design, planning, building, we're talking about how do you configure the human spaces in a city so that those interactions, those qualities of communication right, emerge. Because they will emerge from human beings if you don't mess them up too much. If they understand you know, simple rules about what their goal is. Their goal is to feed people to have food available for sale whether it's sea bass, or whether it's strawberries, or whether it's mizuna, or whether it's blackberry honey, it's going to be there in New York City for whoever wants it. You know? And um, I think that, <clears throat> again, this is like, what I've got to say about that is like, we know what to do. We actually already know how to do this. It's a question of where aren't we doing it and why. Thank you. Do you want me to talk now? So Peter, talk to us about, now Peter's going to take some of these ideas and ground them in uh, some regional planning. Yeah. Um, so I need a, the scaffolding of slides, because I can, can't remember anything anymore. Um, and before I start, I just want to frame up uh, some thoughts, because uh, the, the idea of resiliency, as it's talked about typically, is a kind of uh, protective notion, which is we have to go back now and fix our cities and our communities in ways that are going to make them resilient, because we have now brought upon ourselves an apocalypse. And you know the apocalypse is coming, and we have to harden ourselves or soften ourselves. We like the idea of soft paths rather than hard paths. But regardless, I, I still wonder whether we shouldn't be thinking more about avoiding the apocalypse as opposed to um, absorbing the uh, 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 apocalypse, which is, seems to be the context of this discussion about re resilience. So I'm a, a kind of pathological optimist, and I think um, we, can, we can still mitigate a lot. And of course, what I'm talking about is climate change. I don't think it's too late. I don't think we don't have the means and the wherewithal. And I wonder sometimes whether we're jumping the gun by saying, well, it's coming, so let's do something to our cities and our communities so that we can withstand it, so we can cope with it, so we can live with it. So that's one context. The other one is that it tends to be discussed in the realm of retrofit. It's a almost backward-looking perspective where we look at what exists and what we have to do to it in order to fix it. What we don't recognize is that we're growing at massive rates all the time. And new growth is, a, uh, is a medicinal. 
uh, or can be used as a medicinal, uh, rather than just focusing on existing conditions. Now, that has to do with place. So if you look at this slide here, this is, you know, and everybody's now very, uh, everybody says, well, we're more than 50% urban. Well, this is true, but who, where are those populations? And you look at the graph, there are three lines. Rural population, which is totally flattened out and will be declining slightly, but not remarkably. Only in China is there a concerted effort to actually shift population. Uh, but of course, as wealth and middle class economies grow, people become urban, and it's a good thing. They have more opportunities, they have more social interaction, uh, the birth rates go down, women have uh, better opportunities. I mean, the list is very long, uh, positive attributes of urbanism. Now, the wealthy developed regions, you see also, is almost flatlining at a million. And uh, we, we think that, for example, in the state of California, we're going to go from 35 million up to 45 or 50 million. This is what we were doing our planning for, and we think this is a big deal. But the middle bar, the less developed regions, are really where the future of the planet is going to be determined. How those cities, and those are urban, that's an urban line, um, you know, how we build that next billion and a half or two billion uh, worth of cities really matters. And so the forward looking rather than just the retrofit perspective I think is really important and also who and where and what levels of economies. Now this is a really complicated graph and I don't think it really relates to the topic today but, I, oh, but I'm in love with this graph so I wanted to put it up here so you could all, we could all share it. And maybe somebody, maybe one of you guys can make the linkage for me. Yes. Okay, so on the uh, x-axis is population. The four bars are 25% um, income brackets. Um, and the height is the amount of carbon per capita. So this relates carbon emission to wealth. And then over time. So the lower bar is 9.3 billion. That's where um, the World Bank and UN thinks we're going to end up in 2050. And the distribution uh, that I've created there is what I think, actually, technically what the IPCC says is a sustainable carbon output. So what's fascinating about this is that low-income people don't have to change a thing. Uh, Low-middle don't have to change a thing. It's really up to wealthy people to change their lifestyle. And they have to go from, at the highest end, about 11 tons. And this is a simple way of thinking about your life. I mean, how many tons a year do you get to put into the atmosphere? Personally, not by country. I know there's all these debates about, you know, which countries are going to do how much or what, what uh, energy, uh, what sector of the economy is going to do X, Y, and Z. But just boil it down to the most simple thing. So 12 is the average for wealthy. United States is 23 on average. California is 10. Not bad. We're already at 10, uh, although it varies, and I'll get into that in a minute. Now, in order to get to the solution, all we have to do is get down to around three tons per capita of wealthy people. What kind of lifestyle, what kind of city does that represent? It's actually not far-fetched at all. At the bottom, Sweden today is at five tons per capita and they're a wealthy economy. So you see, the solution is not so remote, and you don't have to be so pessimistic. You know? And I think that changes the way we talk about resilience, because we are, you know, this term seems to have emerged out of a kind of frightened sensibility that we have really screwed things up, and we better uh, run for cover or change everything. And so I tend to be a little more forward thinking on this. So we, California 2050, the Vision California project we did, we ended up at 3.3 per capita. So California, with its current policies, can actually get to where the globe needs to be. And it will be a role model for upper middle class lifestyles around the planet. Totally doable. This is just that same old thing of where we are compared to other. Uh, San Francisco, interestingly enough, is about six tons per capita. The suburbs, San Ramon, is around 21. So, you know, right within our own community, there's that kind of range of behavior and uh, environmental impact. And I guess what I'm really saying is prevention is better than protection when it comes to resilience. Um, 
and I'll try to be a little quicker here. The other point I want to make is that these solutions um, are whole systems. In other words, you can't think of them just in terms of carbon or in terms of water or in terms of resilience or in terms of social equity. In the end, whenever you mess with cities and regions, you change everything at once. It's all deeply interlocked. And understanding the interlocked quality, I think, is at the heart of uh, the kind of thinking that we have to go to. So we did the scenarios in California. Uh, for our AB uh, 375, SB 375, which is our land use law that relates to carbon. And we were asked to do the carbon analysis of what impact smart growth would have over a uh, standard sprawl. And these are the numbers. Very significant. Actually quite easy to get to a very significant change in, in uh, carbon emissions. But linked to this change is a whole range of other ones. Obviously, the amount of traffic, air quality impacts, costs of roads, costs of oil, international policy related to cost of oil, all sorts of other things come with that. And the fuel consumption, the resilience of our economy based on its current need for fuel. But going beyond that, land consumption changed dramatically. And so all of a sudden, resilience, if you think of state of California as an agricultural um, economy that produces massive amounts of food for the whole globe and, and, and the state, this has a huge impact on that level, that kind of resilience. Now, is it the right kind of farming? Well, that's a whole other discussion. But you can't have that discussion if you don't have the land. And the reduction here, business as usual between now and 2050 in California would basically double the urban footprint. We now are at 5,300 uh, squ uh, square uh, miles of uh, urbanization in the state of California. We would double it if we kept on growing the same way. So redirecting future growth is perhaps the most important thing that we can be focused on, even in a low growth area like ours. Now when you get to China and Asia and Africa, you're talking about really the, the, the future is yet to unfold and the opportunities are uh, extraordinary. Building energy changes when you change urban form. There's less single family, more efficient buildings, even before you put solar collectors and great windows and shades and all the rest of the things that we know well how to do. Just by shifting, that's why when you live in San Francisco in a flat, you're doing better than living in San Ramon in a single family dwelling. Water, another factor of resilience, um, and of course, water consumption is directly proportional to urban land area. And there's a simple correlation there. But then that triggers back into energy, because a third of our electricity in California is used to pump water around the state. And so all these interconnected qualities. The good news, infrastructure cost, and this goes to not only fiscal coherence of local governments, but also um, annual household. And so we get to social equity. What we showed was smart growth for the state would reduce on average the, and this is in today's dollars, and the median income in California is $50,000 a year. Hasn't changed much in the last 20 years. Uh, and we could save 20% of that. That is a, that, that's probably the single largest thing we can do for affordability and social equity, is just to reduce those costs. And the dependence on the car, of course, is the, the huge factor there. Respiratory, and now the model that we've worked on to derive all these numbers, we're adding uh, obesity and, and, and activity-related diseases. So health is deeply impacted by the kinds of cities we have, air quality and the propensity to walk and bike and do things uh, that are more active than cars. And the good news is we can create scenarios and actually understand all the, the various impacts. Uh, that We can quantify this stuff and we can make intelligent choices. And I think we can get at resilience, uh, but we can get at a lot more at exactly the same time. Um, you know, shotguns are always better than, than rifles. Uh, so now we're being asked to work in Mexico City on a regional plan, and some of the preliminary data there is very interesting. When you look at where the money is, it's all downtown, unlike United States, where all the money went to the suburbs. It's all downtown. That's also where all the jobs are. And then, of course, the poor people have been moved to the periphery. 
And this is where the jobs are. They coincide with where the wealthy people are. So they have access, and then a huge part of the population has no access. The, the, um, the area where people actually have access to decent transit is, uh, is less than 30 percent, and that's the, the, the various zones. We can map out where access to transit and where access to jobs are, and then how disconnected people are, and then we can overlay and find out, well, these are all the low-income low people. In Mexico, they have colectivos, which are these informal buses, which are great, organic. You think it's a resilient thing, but the reality is they stop anywhere for anybody, and it takes, on average, three hours a day for uh, low-income households to commute, uh, low-income workers to commute. Now, that's not resilient. That's not u resilient in the sense of using human potential in a wise way. Now, China is, uh, is another one of these stories of how we're really getting our cities wrong, and until we get our cities right, I don't know whether we can start talking about embellishing uh, other factors into it. But the super block, the air quality, the congestion, and this is a place that's going to build cities for 350 million people in the, by the year 2025. And they, I mean, and they will do that. So they're basically going to build the equivalent of the United States in the next 10 or 15 years. And believe me, by the number of cranes you see around there, that's probably true. So their status really is high density sprawl. There's nothing resilient about this. But actually, it's not that different than this, which is us. I mean, they're basically both the same thing. They're just isolated people, isolated uses, no connectivity, no resilience. And of course, the results are the same world over. Uh, the pedestrian is dying, literally. Um, and this is actually a computer model of an existing developed area outside of Kuming. Uh, and what we showed was you could actually take it and reform exactly the same quantity of development, same quantity of infrastructure, more open space into walkable mixed-use places, which I don't need to spend a lot of time on. But for China, reframing how they grow is one of those big steps that the planet has to make. Because if they get it wrong, we're burdened with environments that will take an extraordinary amount of effort to fix, either towards resilience or just plain sustainability. Um, so here in Chongqing, this is a town, a, a province that has 30 million people. This is a province as big as California. And the study area that they gave us was for 4 million new population. And the first thing we did was we said, you have to look at the natural setting as a framework for all city growth. And this was a radical idea in China because for them, it's about bulldozers and and super blocks. And so just preserving hilltops and repairing corridors was a big, giant step away from business as usual. Uh, these are the existing developed areas. These are the, what we call the walkable zones that, can be, that actually can be communities that are mixed enough and have uh, urban quality enough to walk through. Robust transit systems, and then um, uh, the, the uh, transit nodes. So you can see, even in this context of massive growth, you can create walkable communities at a large scale, which inherently are more um, resilient. Or maybe this isn't a topic. I don't care. I only have one story to tell, you know, so <laughs> I, I try to relate it to the topic, but you, you guys got to help me. If there's any way of linking this to uh, resilience, I don't know. Um, it's just better, healthier cities. I know uh, ULI cares about health, right? Healthy cities. So that's, there's a connection there. And Paul, you said health and they're, they're together. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're happy. there's some kind of relationship here, but God knows what it is. Um, well, here's something resilient. Uh, we got them to set the city back away from the rivers so they won't flood. There's enough topo here that they didn't really have to worry about it. But the idea that there's a riparian corridor that's filled with natural life, that has some relationship to the historic uh, ecology that is actually the thing that frames the community, and then what centers the community is the transit. Those are all things that I think make these, this kind of vision a more resilient uh, future. Now, it's easy to show renderings like this for new growth. It's harder to retrofit your way there. I know, I worked on the recovery plan in Louisiana. And um, 
the idea of backing away from dangerous territory is a very difficult one that maybe we need to talk about, or maybe that is too specific. But uh, they're very, they're very different conditions, the new and the retrofit. Retrofit's harder, which is why I don't bother with it now, because it's so difficult and I'm getting too old to <laughs> do difficult things. But the, the reality is getting it right in the first place really counts. And if you remember the bar graph that I started with about that next billion and a half to two billion of urban population on this planet, we have to get those urban environments right, because going back and fixing them later is not an option. I think that's it. So I'm going to, um, by the way, later I'll show, oh, here it is, perfect. OK, so hmm. uh, <laughs> what is that? It's a, it's a slide I was get. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. I, actually, it's got the wrong information. It's got good information, but different information that I wanted to give you. Um, so Dan Siegel has an amazing talk on the Garrison Institute website about the mind and city, the relationship between the mind and city. I'm going to give you just a few pieces of it, but if, uh, if you go to www.garrisoninstitute.org, you can, you, can, you can Google it and find it. So Dan says that the mind is an embodied process, so it means it's physical, uh, and it regulates the flow of energy and information in the body. What Peter made very clear, what Paul talked about natural systems and Peter talked about urban systems, and they are both embodied. They are both in physical places. And they both, and, and what each talked about in a different way, um, is this emergent process of managing the flow. So uh, Paul talked more directly about the managing the flow of energy and information. What Peter was really talking about is how do you physically lay out a, syst a city so that this flow happens more, is, is easier to happen, so you have fewer physical barriers towards connectivity. And Paul was talking about how important connectivity is. Um, so one of the interesting things that, uh, by the way, I believe that in addition to the flow of energy and of information, that cities need to regulate the flow of materials, money, and people. But again, the regulator is not because the mayor regulates them, that's impossible. And it's not, it again is, it is this self-emergent kind of regulation. Dan says the brain succeeds because it integrates different districts or centers of the mind into a complex and coherent flow. So its function is the creation of coherence. And he has a phrase that he calls faces to uh, describe that. Faces stands for being flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable. And those are the qualities of a healthy mind. And what I would pose is those are also the qualities of a healthy city, or a resilient city. And so let's go through those again. Number one is flexible. And what we have found is uh, that there are physical patterns and ways of laying out cities, organizing infrastructure that is static and that is rigid. And there are ways that, is more, that are more flexible. So for example, distributed energy. So when we have a, a, a fixed grid and there's three power plants and they're all burning coal and that's how the city's only power source, it's a very rigid system and very vulnerable if one of those power plants go down. Whereas if you have distributed energy throughout the city, solar on tops of roofs, et cetera, biodigesters, et cetera, then you have a much more emergent system in which it's not as reliant on any one piece and it's inherently more flexible. Adaptive is the ability to adapt to change. I began by describing the macro trends, these huge changes that are coming our way. And what we're seeing is that, so starting with uh, the 1920s and zoning, we had, our American zoning system is incredibly rigid. We have a multifamily zone and a single family zone and an industrial zone. Um, and yet, first of all, we've seen that the categories of how people live and work have changed and don't necessarily fit those zones. But, and secondly, the interaction, we're seeing connectivity and interaction is really what leads to the health of a city and the resilience of a city. And so we need a more dynamic zoning system. We need the, the regulatory regime of cities to be more adaptive. And we need to continually look at where we think it's rigid and figure out how to make it adaptive. I think there's a panel later today or tomorrow on um, 
maybe it's even now, on um, adaptive zoning systems, on dynamic zoning systems, which I think is very important. Coherent, which means is that all these pieces are moving independently, they're also moving interdependently, and they have to add up to a kind of coherence. When you lack coherence, that's when um, you have, for example, epilepsy in the brain, et cetera. And so this managing of coherence has to be, again, there's no one guy, as Paul points out, who can manage coherence. It has to actually be a distributed responsibility. If you look at how, when they look at like thousands of birds all fly in a flock in the same place, what they've discovered is there are these few rules they call flocking rules. And if each bird follows a few directions, about how distance between neighbors and setting a direction in the same way as neighbors, et cetera. The whole flock, or by the way, school of fish, is totally coherent. And you've seen with school of fish are like this, all of a sudden they turn like that and everybody's like in perfect order. It's, again, it's not because there's a master system. It's because there's an internal system of rules that allow for distributed coherence, distributed uh, balance amongst everybody that creates group coherence. Energized means that, so what's interesting is we find, so Paul, Peter described the amazing growth that is going on in the world. And it really is a tremendous opportunity. Any of you who are working in shrinking cities, in deindustrializing cities, in cities with no economic oomph, know how incredibly hard it is to get anything done. There's just not the money, the resources, the flow, the, the change, all you have is decay, to move forward. When there's energy, when there's activity, when there's growth, then we can actually utilize that growth for transformation. And the last thing is stable. I mentioned again in the beginning volatility and how difficult it is to deal in a volatile world. And what we find in a world that has inherent stability or a system that tends towards a stable balance. It's not a rigid balance. It's not a fixed balance. It's a it's a sense of, uh, but it's a harmonious balance. Um, but that's actually healthier, and it's a it, it's stability, if you think about it, is a quality of well-being. Dan says, describes all this as coherent flow. It's the coherent flow of energy and information through the mind that is helping balance the body. And he describes this coherent flow as being bounded as like a river. And one bank is chaos, and the other side is rigidity. And what you're looking for is not to be so fixed that you're rigid, and not to be so uncontrolled that you're chaotic. But you need to find the coherent flow that's the pathway in between the two of those. Um, so what's interesting is that we live in a natural world, a world in which ultimately the rules, you know, like uh, Wall Street didn't invent gravity and didn't invent entropy. The essential rules of how we organize our cities, how we live, how we develop, are natural rules. We live in a world that is rapid, rapidly growing, and if you look at climate change, if you look at the issues that are before us, they are all human-caused issues. They all come from human behavior. Nature was actually quite in balance, was doing very well before we and we're part of nature before we started changing it. And one of the things Paul often says is, what's your quote about uh, nature heals? Oh, um, it's a childhood observation, but no matter how much we burn, destroy, mine, poison, clear cut, uh, nature, the moment we stop, the nanosecond we stop, nature, life regenerates, begins to regenerate. It's the default mode of life, and nothing can stop it. And then the corollary to that is, although it sounds like a truism and a cliche, is we are life. And it is the default mode of humanity as well, despite what you see in headlines and CNN and New York Times and ISIS and beheadings. It is our default mode, and that's what we're doing. So the question is, so we live in an entropic world. That means it's wearing down. That means that everything technical that we build, the cities we build, the buildings we build, et cetera, are always in decline. And what we see is that nature, when, so when you leave our, our stuff alone, it, it wears out. When you leave nature alone, it builds back up. So what we've tried to describe today are what are some of the characteristics that allow the human systems to 
create some of the regenerative capacity, some of the adaptive capacity, some of the regenerative qualities that will allow the human systems to have the regenerative, resilient qualities that natural systems have. So, do you guys have any thoughts for each other? Well, I want to double down on what Peter's saying about <clears throat> climate change. Um, I'm part of a, uh, a group called Project Drawdown, and, and um, drawdown.org, it's just a splash page. Some of our directors are here, John Picard and Sean is here, and our advisors, there she is, and Peter Busby from Perkins and Will is an advisor, and Jonathan's an advisor, and John Coster from Skanska is going to be an advisor if he doesn't know it yet. And <clears throat> but what it is, is that the math has been done on what happens with business as usual on climate change, no question about it. And Bill McKibben did the terrifying math, of, you know, in 2012, and then uh, the tour, and we're well versed in the catastrophization of the future and how the shit is going to hit the fan and what's going to happen. What we're not well versed on at all, and no one has done the math, and this is what Project Drawdown is about, is doing the math about what we are doing right now. We. Not what we're going to do, not what we think we could do, and not if only this, this might happen, or if we get carbon capture systems in our coal plants. No, what we are actually doing right now. And Drawdown has 100 solutions, social and other and practical technologies, that we have metrics, measurements, the WW Granger, you can buy it now, and, and we're implementing it worldwide. And what it does is simply measure the impact it will have over the next 30 years if it increments and increases in scale in a not unreasonable way. And what happens tentatively, what we know, is that by 2045, we can hit drawdown, which is that year when the amount of carbon in the atmosphere inflects downwards. And we have that within our capacity right now, and new technologies are being invented every single day, especially in this state, that will even further uh, help us do that. And that means within 20 years of 2045, we can get the first year of actual cooling. It takes 20, it's a 20 year lag time from drawdown. And drawdown.org is being created by 200 graduate students, 14 universities, government agencies, foundations, um, and our technical and scientific advisors, some of whom are here. Uh, it's what we, it's our book, we're creating it, it's us reflecting back to ourselves what it is that we know we can do in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and so, but it, it shows that we, if we do the math and think about it, that we have the tools in place right now to have a very different future. It doesn't mean that we need resiliency in our cities. We need it all the time. They were designed to be rigid and, and, and to break down in ways that were not, design, uh, not intended. But I also think we really have to focus on what we can do to avoid as opposed to just simply focus on what's going to happen if we don't do anything. You know, uh, so much of the discussion always focuses, and I, I don't think you're positing it this way, but that there are technologies, that technology is going to save us. And I think technology is advancing, and there's all sorts of great solutions. Mm -hmm. But underlying the technology, uh, I think it has to be lifestyle change, and that's mm -hmm. changes in our cities. And it's very simple, it's very straightforward, and it's actually very desirable on a million ways, and it's already in motion. So if we can think of cities as a technology, yep. that it's, it actually is the most robust and uh, I think will be the most successful technology we can apply to this problem. And so, and that starts, and that reduces the burden on all the other technologies. Right. And so, you know, as you watch good environmentalists come out against uh, wind farms in, in the Northeast because it obscures views, or you, other good environmentalists coming out against um, uh, solar collectors in the desert because certainly uh, it sterilizes the land. Uh, there, there, or you, uh, and I won't say good, but so-called environmentalists come out against high-speed rail because it impacts certain pieces of land and ecologies. Um, there is no solution that doesn't have environmental impacts but for conservation. And by conservation, I don't mean just more our value in the walls. I mean 
how you live, where you live. And a lot of the resilience issues has to do with where people live. I mean, just reducing the footprint of urban growth in California by 4,000 square miles changes the amount of land that has to be, quote unquote, protected or in some way thoughtfully put in relationship to environmental hazards. Mm -hmm. And so all this stuff, I think, foundational is this technology we might want to call the city. And I want to really back that up. One of the things we discovered, <clears throat> one of the main contributors to reducing emissions in 2045 is educating girls in the developing world. So this idea that somehow there's a techno fix, you know, that if we get enough technologies assembled, then we've somehow passed through, you know, uh, that threshold. This is simply not true. They're needed as well. Yeah. But the so-called social, I don't call them technologies, but these solutions that come from from really focusing on the breadth and the depth of our system. And one of the things when we educate girls in the developing world, you know, they generally get pulled out or drop out of school uh, just at puberty. And for a lot of good reasons, no latrines and embarrassment, other reasons. And if we make schools and a girl goes to 10th grade, birth rates go from five to two. And that is measured, known, it's been known for decades. And so we're putting money over here. We might very wisely put more money into educating women in the world. And that would have, again, a, an, an enormous impact on the well-being of all people everywhere far into the future. Because those girls, they, their, their daughters behave very differently as well than so forth. So why don't we open it up to questions and comments from the floor. One of the summary points I take from that is how important human behavior is. Mm -hmm. That behavior is really a key. Behavior is the operating system of our technology. Yes. I think that attitude and is paramount. And you've said that, and Tim said that. I'm a little confused by some of the points Peter and Paul made in that um, you know, we shouldn't give in. We should certainly be optimistic. We should certainly plan for a better future. And a lot of it has to do with attitude. I agree with all that. And I think technologically will do great things in terms of energy uh, technology where we don't put carbon in the atmosphere and draw down and planning better cities is great. But we also have to be brutally honest, I think, with ourselves and the world. And even if we didn't put any more carbon in the atmosphere from today, let alone the half, the 50% population increase that's now in the pipeline to take us from the 7 billion to the 10 billion. And I assume that that goal was targeted at the two degrees Celsius. If we get two degrees Celsius as a global temperature average, even if we succeed in that, which very many doubt we can do, but let's take your optimism. That's 3.8 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's a global average. And on land, that means it's about five and a half degrees because of the difference between oceans and land. That's a very different planet's climate ecosystem, for one, for 10 billion people, nine and a half billion people. And the second is, in terms of, sure, we should be positive and not give in and think good thoughts and all that stuff. But there's enough heat in the ocean to raise sea level three or four feet from where we are today. And so I think we need to balance optimism, but with realism, because Miami and the Florida Keys and the Bahamas and Bangladesh and lots of places on this planet are going to be underwater in our kids' lifetimes. Even if we were 100% successful with drawdown today. So I think that attitude, as my friend Tim says, is. You know, we can work on ourselves. I think your optimism is wonderful, but I think we've got to be realistic here, too, because otherwise we're deluding people. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. I, I, I agree with you, by the way. <clears throat> um, what does being realistic mean to you? Well, that, that whether it be us, my, our friends, family, but the people we talk to, to say, um, Let's try and do the right things with energy. Let's try and do the right things with design. But let's adapt where there's enough, where there's enough heat in the pipeline or 90% of the heat's in the ocean already. Let's be realistic to say, how do we design for
for that world by the year 2050. Assuming we do all the right things within it, all the things you describe. Right. But if sea level is three or four, you know, it's two feet higher, let's say by 2050, that's a, that's a huge challenge. And that's a disruption. So to, when I say realistic, it's there are things we can affect attitudinally in ourselves. There are things we can affect by positive thinking about what we can do in terms of solar and lots of energy and, and, and better city designs and transportation. But if the ocean is a foot or two higher, we have to, that's a reality to me, where the shoreline is. Yeah. I, I just want to say I don't believe in positive thinking. I think it's just, and I don't believe in hope either. Okay. Because both of them, uh, hope is just the pretty face of fear. Because you can't have hope. Hope is the, is the what? The pretty face of fear. Okay. And because um, that's really, you can't have hope unless you have fear. And I believe in positive doing. And so what we're talking about in Drawdown is what people are doing, not what they're thinking. Of course, thinking precedes doing. And I mean, I agree with you. Adaptivity is not marginalized by moving towards Drawdown. It, it, it's not, in a sense, seconded or put over here or marginalized. Uh, knowing the, the fact Drawdown exists and all these initiatives and solutions are happening because people have a very keen sense of what's coming down the road. So the science, which you described in brief, or the predictions of the science, you know, the, 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 the consensus view is sharpening people's wits and changing who they are, what they do, how they do it, and, and, and the vectors in society. So they actually go together. It's not as though there's realism and then there's positivity. I don't, like I said, I don't believe in positive thinking because, you know, affirmations and the idea that somehow, some way, in every way, you know, we're going to be better in every day. It's like, that's just bullshit. And, um, you know, but what isn't bullshit is the intention of virtually everybody in this room. That isn't. And so it's really the only thing we can change is our intention, and from our intention comes our action. And what science is doing, and what the realism is doing, what the predictions are doing, the IPCC, and we have IPCC senior authors and lead authors on the advisory board of Drawdown. So we bring that science in. We have Michael Mann, we have others, uh, is to make sure that what we come up with is honest, realistic, that the models work, that it's not pie in the sky, it's not egging the pudding, that it is actually a really clean, clear, honest, and impeccable description of what's possible, but it doesn't obviate mm -hmm. what's coming and the damage that will be experienced. Well, I'm glad to hear that attitude of reality versus positivism. The, Michael Mann and, and I had dinner a couple of months ago, and one of the things we discussed and I've discussed this with other leading scientists, is that we, we tend to think of the climate system, which is a very dynamic system, yeah. and forget that the lag time, yeah. because of the heat that's already been stored in the ocean, changes the dynamics. Exactly. Because, and, and we have to remember that as well. Well, somebody said to you, oh, well, you get drawdown, and all that's going to happen is all the CO2 is going to come right back out of the ocean. We said, exactly. That's exactly what we want, right. to deacidify oceans. So. so our time has come to an end. Oh, dear. But I'm going to give each of you guys a minute for a closing statement. Um, well, actually, uh, I, I didn't mean to say we can't attend to the uh, kind of retrofits that are uh, obviously necessary. Um, my point was simply that we need to stop building environments that need extraordinary measures of protection. And, you know, once again, having worked in Louisiana, what was fascinating to watch there was, number one, people who lived below sea level wanted to continue living. I mean, the Ninth Ward, the people who lived there were not going to move. And so there's a, there's a kind of tenacity to that. And the result is you need more levees. Now, along came the Army Corps of Engineers who literally wanted to build a levee from Mississippi to Texas, uh, complete the whole line. And the fascinating thing about that is it made people feel secure, but it also then encourages people to live behind the levee. There's a false sense of, of security. So we have to be very thoughtful. And this is, you know, I, I, I don't know whether I can fully lump this together or not, but it's a little bit like solar collectors. If you've got solar collectors on the roofs, you've done your job. And that's not true. If you've got a levee out front, you've done your job. It's really not true. It's a false sense of security. The systemic solution is people move and live on high ground. That's the systemic. 
solution. Um, but we all know politically that's not going to happen. Uh, and so there's going to be this complicated mix of strategies. I don't think any of these strategies are actually going to make it economically unless they solve many problems simultaneously. So the idea that a levy is just riprap versus, and Harry Tregoning last night was making a beautiful talk about uh, the strategies that have come up in, in dealing with Sandy, uh, turning those into ecological parks that provide public access to waterfronts. And there's a solution that, that really has legs because it solves more than one problem at a time. The greatest uh, challenge I think we have is the challenge of specialists, specialization. That you have individuals solving one problem at a time when you need generalists solving six problems simultaneously. And problems that are current and problems that are of the future. And so the, you have to be a generalist in terms of time span as well. But, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's always easy to say all of the above because it's hard to be wrong if you say all of the above. Uh, but in this circumstance, it really is an all of the above solution. There's no one silver bullet. There's no one attitude. It's not just retrofit. It's not just new growth. It's not just lifestyle. It's not just technology. It's actually how all these things weave together. And you can only get to that, that a really complex, healthy weave by having a whole systems a approach. And one of our deepest uh, things that we miss is that we don't have generalists, we have specialists. And uh, those specialists are always carving out their own stovepipe and their own political turf and their own economic ground. And they, in so doing, uh, de-optimize uh, everything that we should be achieving. Just quickly, I would say that the purpose of of I think what we're talking about, what Peter's talking about, and Jonathan's doing uh, in his forthcoming book, Resilient Cities, and what I'm talking about with Drawdown is what can be called availability heuristics, which is really another complicated word for what comes up, what comes to your mind when the word climate change comes up, and how many of you have a really up feeling about it, and I raise your hand, and uh, <clears throat> Shana, who's on our board. And, uh, but the, 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 what we're talking about here is really changing what comes first to mind when a word comes up. And that has a huge effect on behavior, attitude, and how we conduct ourselves in the world. And so the purpose of Drawdown and that is to reflect back to ourselves what it is that we know that can make a, a, a realistic change going forward so that we have the sense that our children will have the possibility of a stable, prosperous existence. And that, when that changes, then everything changes. Whereas right now, the heuristics around climate change are catastrophization of the future. And all I'm saying is it's not that the science is incorrect and that the, we, we certainly understand how that arose, but we need something better for us to mobilize and to organize around. And I want to quote the Beatles and say, you're such a lovely audience. Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>